Hey, what's up? If we've not met before, I'm Matt, the online director here at Grace. And whether you watch Grace at home every single week or you're new to Grace, I'm glad that you're here. If you are new to Grace, I'd love the chance to connect with you this week and to send you a small gift just to say thanks for watching. Text new to the number that you see on your screen and let me know how I can connect with you. Now, Grace Church is here to help you, your friends, and neighbors know and follow Jesus, and you can help us play a part in doing that. Take two seconds right now, hit the share button, and help us serve those that you know and care about. And now, we're going to be joining our lead pastor, Sean, as he continues our series in the book of James, followed by two songs, and then I'll let you know how you can connect with us this week. Thanks for being a part of our services today. My name is Sean Sears. I'm the lead pastor here at Grace Church. And we're doing a teaching today. This is our fifth one out of the book of James. James is toward the end of uh, the Greek scriptures or what Christians would refer to as the New Testament. Um, and while it's toward the end, it's there's only seven books until the end of the Bible. It was actually one of the very first, if not the first book to be written that was included in the New Testament. And it's the only book of the Bible written by James the half-brother of Jesus and the pastor of the, the first pastor of the Church of Jerusalem. Uh, he opens up his letter by telling every, introducing himself, just like I just did, and then uh, uh, telling everybody that you're going to go through hard times, and when you do, uh, you're going to grow through it, and you're going to find purpose in it. God, God doesn't waste our, our pain. And then he gets right into the meat of, of his letter. Uh, so knowing that this is the very first official letter sent to this brand new movement, this church, um, James wanted to put in there the stuff that he felt was most important. The stuff that he felt like followers of Jesus ought to be focused on uh, most. And right out of the bat, he says, if you really have turned from sin to begin following Jesus, if you really have repented of your disobedience towards God and your selfishness towards others, if you really have accepted that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is the only thing that takes away your sin, you've called on God to forgive you and save you, then your heart's been transformed. And if your heart really has been transformed, then you'll be able to see that in the things that come out of your heart. Um, like our actions. Our actions come from our heart. Uh, the words that we speak come from our heart. So if you want to know how your heart is doing, just listen to the words that are coming out of your mouth. If they're toxic, if they're unhealthy, if they're right? Hurtful if they're corrupt. <laughs> corrupt is kind of a big word, isn't it? But if you don't like the tone of the words that come out of your mouth, uh, that's an indication that your heart isn't healthy. And the same thing is true with your actions. Uh, he said that you say that you have faith, uh, but your, your actions don't show it. He said, I don't know that if you have it. He says, your faith is actually faith that doesn't produce a change in your heart, which produces a change in your actions is a faith that's dead, is what he says. And last week, so it's your words and actions. Uh, last week, so there's a spirit of humility that your words and actions should come from. So when he gives us the the uh, the teaching that our, our words and our actions should match our, our faith, he's not trying to give you a new checklist to make sure that you're, you know, marking off as you go. Uh, he says he says that there ought to be a, a spirit of humility that comes from a heart of wisdom. Uh, and that's that's what change. That's where the, that change comes from, is that humility. And if there was a a, a verse that kind of summarizes the idea in the last five, excuse me, four chapters of the book of James, outside that first introduction chapter, uh, I think it would be James chapter uh, four, verse six. The second half of that verse says this: that God opposes the proud but favors the humble. Uh, God opposes the proud and favors the humble. I, I, I want, uh, this is a weird way to put it, but I, I want God's favor. Like, is, is that a weird way to put that for you? I, I want I want to be blessed by God. I think we all do. I mean, that's, that's why you're a part of the service, probably. Like, that's got to be at least a part of the motivation, is that I want to put myself in the best position, not just to be blessed by God because it's all about what I get from Him, but I, I, I want to live the life that God wants me to live. I I know that God created me for a purpose. The scriptures teach that. We're going to be looking at a few of the other verses in the Bible that talk about uh, God's intentionality behind your existence this uh, today. Um, but I, I definitely don't want to be in a position that God feels he has to <laughs> oppose me, 
right? Like I, I definitely don't want to be in that, that position at all. And the key to being favored or opposed has everything to do uh, with the balance between humility and pride in my heart. And that kind of sets the tone for um, the, uh, the chapter two, chapter three, but also chapter four and chapter five, which is what we're looking at uh, today and, and next weekend. He repeats that idea in verse 10 of chapter four when he says, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. What does that look like? Like when he tells me to humble myself before the Lord so that God will lift me up in honor, what are the things that I need to be focusing on? I think all of us would love the confidence of knowing that God is working on our behalf behind the scenes to bring us to a place uh, where he gets to honor us and whatever that means. And that's not me saying that God needs to honor me. Uh, that's not the spirit behind the teaching or even the things that James is saying. James is just acknowledging so that you know God does take the humble and he lifts them up in honor. That's that's what God's going to do. I I I I would I would love that. Like I I want every area of my life to be touched by God's goodness, my marriage, uh, my relationship with my kids, my finances, uh, my emotional health, my physical health, my other interpersonal relationships, my career. If God has something for me that God would describe as honorable, bro, I, I want every, I want every bit of that. Uh, in today's teaching, James unpacks what it means to humble yourself before the Lord in every area of life. Uh, there are three assumptions that he addresses. These are false assumptions. And these false assumptions become an operating system that drive the decisions that we make. And these three assumptions put us in a place to be opposed by God. But if we could, if we could flip this, if we could look at all three of these things differently, it puts us in a place, and this would be how James defines what it looks like for me to humble myself so that the Lord will lift me up in honor. The first one is this, that I am the judge of you. The second false assumption is that I am the boss of me. And then the third false assumption is that my life is my own. And he goes right through all three of these assumptions. And I'm going to start with the first one that he mentions, which is the idea that I am the judge of you. That's in James chapter 4, verse 11. And here's what he says. Don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's laws. God's law. Your job is to just obey the law, not determine, not to judge whether or not it applies to you. You just need to do what God has called you to do. I just need to do what God has called me to do. Verse 12 says, God alone who gave the law is the judge. He alone has the power, the right, the authority to save or to destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? So James has just given us this information uh, about the words and actions and the spirit of humility as being evidence that our heart really has been changed. And after giving us this information, what James knows that we're most likely to do is then use that test to determine if everybody else is really a Christian. That's what we do. We take this information and rather than using this as a mirror to check my own heart, what I begin doing is I put this up as a test against your heart. That's what I'm doing. Like, I, I want to see if your words are matching what you say you believe your faith or if your actions are matching your faith. And God forbid you say anything sideways to me or, or do anything that I don't like or I sniff any, any sense of pride or arrogance in you. But, and then now I have determined that you're a fake, that you're, you're not a genuine Christian. That's what we do with this information. So he gives us the information so that we could do a self-test. And the problem is that we make this become a litmus test that we impose on other people. So he comes right out of the gate is saying, if you want to humble yourself, then here's what it means you're going to do. You're not going to speak. You're not going to talk crap anymore. <laughs> That's really what he's saying. You're not going to speak evil against other people, especially your brothers and sisters. And you're not going to criticize them. 
and you're not going to judge them. That's what we're, we're not going to do. So you should never speak evil against another Christian. You should never criticize another Christian. And we should never judge another Christian. Real quick, I want to unpack each one of these. And I, I think the speaking evil against other people, we get that. Like, that's not a hard sell. I probably shouldn't be speaking evil of anyone, right? Like, I'd, we know those verses about, or you can find those, Google those verses about gossip. We Like, you don't even have to be religious. And you know that speaking bad about other people is bad, uh, right? Like you you might not have even been raised in a religious home, but your mom and dad, because they had good sense and were decent people, told you that it was wrong to do that. So I don't think that this one is the hard sell that we shouldn't speak evil against other people. Uh, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that we are to pray for our enemies and to bless those who, who, who persecute us and make our lives difficult. So if we're to pray for the blessing of people who are our enemies and, and to bless those who've made our lives difficult, then we're definitely supposed to be cool to the people who are on our same team. That's, that's the no-brainer. Don't speak evil against other people. But what about this criticize thing? To criticize someone here is to be a critic towards someone else, to behave in a critical or skeptical way. And, and um, man, I, this is the one that probably sticks out to me as the one that I need, I need most work on. Because what he's saying is, is that, Sean, you're, you're to give people the benefit of the doubt. Like, you're not to be skeptical. Like, don't criticize them. Don't, don't like, e expect the best. Like, as assume the best intentions behind the behaviors you don't understand. And I, and I don't do that. Uh, I've used as an excuse... The fact that I was, uh, I'm was i a preacher's kid raised in a church, and so I've seen uh, the duality of people in the church. I've, I, As a pastor's kid who's been in church every single week of my entire life, unless I was dying, right? Or, um, and back when I was a kid, by the way, you went Sunday morning, Sunday night, Tuesday night for visitation, Wednesday night uh, for church, and then Friday night was usually a church activity, and Saturday morning was bus visitation because we did a bus route. Then I, I was a bus captain, which meant that I would show up at church early. I'm just saying I was super churchy around tons of churchy people, and I and I and I saw a lot of inconsistencies, uh, which 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 ended up becoming an excuse for me to become cynical. And that's what James says, Sean, if you want to humble yourself before God so that he can lift you up in honor, you've got to change your cynical spirit. Like you're really negative about people all the time. Like you, you don't give people any slack and you cut them off if they hurt you. And like the first time, uh, and, and I, I'm not the only one who's like this, I'm sure. And it's probably not you, but the person sitting next to you, right? Like they're the ones who have this problem. So for the person sitting next to you, in me, he says, you've got to stop being so critical toward people. And then the third thing that he says here is, is that you, you shouldn't judge. Um, and, and the idea behind this, uh, don't judge other people, is not that I can't have a difficult conversation with you about things that make either one of us feel awkward. It's, it's not that I can't even come to you and, and point out some type of error or way in which you've offended me or have offended somebody else. That's, that's, that, that's, that's not the idea behind this. And the reason why I know that is because in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus taught his disciples that if somebody has offended you, you need to go to that person one-on-one -on -one and reconcile with them, he says. And then if the problem doesn't go away, if the relationship isn't uh, reconciled, if the problem isn't, the issue isn't resolved, then go back to them with somebody that you both mutually respect and, we're, and, and give it a, another shot. So we are to keep coming to each other uh, when we've offended each other. If I've offended you, you need to come talk to me. And, and it's not that you're, uh, and, and you're not violating that scripture that says uh, you can't judge another person when you come up and you say what you did, uh, it hurt me or it came out wrong or this is something in your life, Sean, that I see because I'm a friend of yours that I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about. Like you have an obligation to do that, I believe. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path, but be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. So we can make an assessment on whether or not somebody has fallen into sin. 
But according to Galatians chapter six, if I'm going to put myself in a position where I'm going to make an assessment on whether or not you've strayed from the path, I now have the obligation to come alongside you gently and humbly, he said, and help you get back on the path again. It's that I don't sit in the bleachers throwing rocks at you, condemning you. Uh, I'm not doing that. I'm not passing judgment on you. What I'm doing is if I see you slip off the path into the gutter, what it means is if I'm going to make the assessment that you've gone off track, that I'm going to get down in the gutter with you and I'm going to help you get back on the right path again. And if I'm getting into the gutter with you, that's why he said, and be careful, those of you who come alongside them, that you don't fall into the same temptation yourself. I think we use that phrase, don't judge me. You can't judge me uh, too quickly. And I think we misuse that phrase. And it probably comes from um, an oversensitivity uh, and an overinflated sense of self. We have thin skin. And if somebody is going to talk to me about something about me that makes me feel uncomfortable, I, I, I put up my dukes. I like I, I put up a wall and I don't judge me, don't come at me, and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna swing back. So so truthfully, there's probably only a few people that I would actually give access to me in the kind of way that they could be those who Galatians chapter six says are godly, who could make the assessment and identify to me how I've gone off track in a way that I would allow them to put their arm around me and to help me get back on track again. Think about what a judge does in the courtroom that nobody else does in the courtroom. Uh, we, we, have, we have attorneys in, in our church. We've had judges in our church. Um, not sure if they've come back from COVID, doesn't matter. We also have advocates in, in our church. Uh, Jesus said in John chapter three, verse 17, he said, God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but to save the world through them. So Jesus said, I haven't come to play the role of judge. And if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, and I'm going to be a follower of Jesus, what right would we have to assume the role in somebody else's life that Jesus has chosen not to play? So what role does Jesus? I mean, he doesn't politely excuse away sin. It's not like Jesus can't identify when somebody's done wrong. He did that, right? Um, but he did it not as judge, he did it as an advocate. And that's what we see in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin, the things that he had written so far in his first letter. Uh, this is the letter of John. Uh, 1 John, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, that's you, that's me. We have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. That's what, that's what Jesus does. He assumes the role of an advocate. Now, an advocate who sits in the courtroom on the side of the courtroom behind the defendant is, has access to the same information about the accused that the attorneys do, the prosecuting attorney and the defendant, the defending attorney, the defense, uh, and, and the judge. But the advocate plays a different role. So while the advocate is fully aware of the brokenness and the faults in the person who's accused, the role that they take in the life of the accused is completely different from either one of the attorneys or the judge. And so what the scripture says is that I'm not the one to declare someone guilty and pass sentencing, pass judgment. That's not my job. That's God's job. Jesus said I could but that's not why I came. There will be a day when Jesus does, when God does pass judgment on mankind for all of their sins individually, but that day is not today. And I, as a devoted follower of Jesus, uh, am, am not to assume a, a, a role that wasn't created for me. I become an advocate. Um, I believe it's 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 to 21, or 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, uh, 17 to 21, where he says that I'm, I'm a reconciler. That's what I am now, that those of us who've been reconciled to God now have the ministry of reconciliation to play in the lives of other people. That our job now is, to pass, is not to pass sentence and judgment on all of those who are guilty of everything we have already been guilty of ourselves, 
But now what we do, having been rescued from the same sin that is still sticking to some of the people that we love and care about most, uh, we become an advocate. Uh, we step into their lives and, and bless them and lift them up and incur we're an advocate. We, we take them out to lunch after the court. We give them a ride home. We check in with them on a weekly basis to make sure that they're following the instructions of the court, right? Like that's, that's what an advocate does and that's what we should be doing also. My job isn't to be your judge, but to be your advocate. And that's going to require time, commitment, transparency, patience, honesty, and love from both of us. This is the kind of humility that will move God to lift me up in honor. The second false assumption is this, that I am the boss of me. Verse 13 of chapter four, look here. You who say today or tomorrow, we're gonna to go to a certain town and stay here, there, stay. Uh, today or tomorrow, we're going to go to a certain town and we'll stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's, it's here a little while and then it's gone. And I, I think we all do this. Uh, and, and there's not a problem with, with making plans. That's not the problem. But he says, look here, those of you who say, this is what I'm going to do, which is all of us. I've got plans. I'm, I'm 50. One, I'm 51. I was going to lie and say 50, but I can't lie in church, right? Um, I'm 51. I'm supposed to be retiring in, what, 14 years, 19 years, Um and then, you know, 40 years, like, I, right? Like, I don't, I don't know when I'm, but now that I, I hit 50, now I'm very aware of this ticking clock. <clears throat> and so I'm, my wife and I are having conversations about what we're going to do to prepare for the day where I no longer have the capacity to work full time. Now, that's not anytime soon, by God's grace and Lord willing, right? Um, but we all make plans. If you're in high school, you're probably thinking about what you want to do or what you're going to do when you get out of high school. Uh, you're either going to go into the trades or you're going to get a full-time job or, <clears throat> excuse me, you're going to start a, a lawn care company or a cleaning service or uh, you're going to do IT. Maybe that's something you already do or, or I don't know, maybe you're going to be a, a sponsored gamer in Call of Duty or Fortnite or whatever. Like I don't, like you've got plans. If you're in college, you know the kind of job you want, or maybe you don't, or you're trying to decide or, or what, what major you're going to have, or where you're gonna to go to grad school, if you go to grad school, who you're gonna marry. All of us are making all different, when you're gonna have kids, if you're gonna have kids, where you're going to move, whether or not you should take this promotion, whether or not you should switch careers, whether or not you should quit working for the man, and then launch out on your own, or start a social media channel that, I don't, I don't, I don't, right? Everybody listen to me is making plans. So what James is saying is, to all of you who make plans, to all of you who are dreaming for your future, um, to, to you who are trying to do something intentional with your life, don't you know that your life is a fog and you don't know when it's going to be lifting? You don't know how much time you have left. And if you're not careful, you're going to presume on God to bless the plans you've made without regard to him. That's where he's going to get with this. We expect God to bless what we want to do, and it doesn't work this way. Job chapter 14, verse 5 reminds us, it says, uh, You, God, have decided the length of our lives. You know how many months we will live, and we are not given a minute longer. God already knows your expiration date. He, he actually knows on the calendar the date that you're, you're going to enter his presence or be separated from him for all of eternity. God, God knows your expiration date. He knows the number of, of days, the number of hours, and the number of minutes. And, and according to Job, you don't get one minute longer than what God's already determined. Uh, the writer of this Psalm uh, 139 put it this way. He said, you saw me before I was born and every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. That's the kind of intentionality that God has around your life. So if God is the one who gave you your life, if God is the one who has determined the length of your life and God has gifted you the assets you have to build the life that you have, doesn't it make sense that before we would say, I'm going to marry this person, I'm going to go to this college, I'm going to drop out of this college, I'm gonna start this business, I'm going to go in and ask for a raise, I'm going to switch careers. We're gonna sell our house and move into a different community. Or we're gonna buy our first house or we're gonna downsize or we're gonna to move to a different state or I wanna bring, 
Doesn't it make sense before you did any of those things, you would run it by God first? And that's what he says Uh, That's what he says in 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 the next verse. So if God determines the events of your life, it would probably be a good idea to confirm all of your plans with him. Remember when you were a little kid uh, in either like at Little League practice or, I don't know, uh, ballet or softball or soccer or Sunday school, you would invite your friend to come over and play at your house without checking with your parents first? Like that never, that never flew with my mom and dad. If I invited them without getting permission first, my mom and dad told me up front, the answer will always be no, because they saw that as disrespect. And I'm wondering if God doesn't see it the exact same way. So James is saying that every decision is ultimately a spiritual one, and you need to run this by God. The question that we ask before every decision should be, what does God want me to do? So the truth is, my job isn't to be the boss of me. James says in James chapter 4, verse 15 to 17, what you ought to say is this, if the Lord wants me to, we will live and do this or do that. Otherwise, you're boasting about your own pretentious plans. We're presuming on the goodness of God to bless our plans. We're boasting on our pretentious plans because we never said, if this is according to God's plan. Now, if I'm saying before every decision, if the Lord is willing, then what I'm also acknowledging is that if God doesn't want me to do this, I'll redirect my life, which might be the reason why we don't do that very often is because we don't know whether or not we can trust God to redirect us. Like, that's a scary thing. That's the kind of faith, that's the kind of humility that puts us in a place to be lifted up by God in honor. He says, otherwise you're boasting about your own pretentious plans and all such boasting is evil. And there's not a lot of things that the Bible says is evil. And this one kind of surprises me because it doesn't feel that big of a deal that I'm making plans and I just didn't pray about it first. Or I didn't put the caveat at the beginning of it or at the end of it that said, that if God wants me to go this direction, I will. For me to make plans about my retirement, for me to start a side hustle, stop a side hustle, start a different side hustle, to to make any changes in my life without acknowledging that I'm only going to do this if God approves it, is the evil? That's evil. Bro, yeah, that, that puts that decision-making stuff in a completely different category than what I had it in. Apparently, that's a really big deal to God when I act like I'm the boss of me. My job is to manage and finesse every area of my life, and this is going to require consistent awareness of the sovereignty and providence of God, which will then move me to a place of humility and dependence on God. And this is the kind of humility that will move God to lift you up and honor. And the last assumption is this, that my life is my own. So the first false assumption is that I am your judge, uh, that I am the judge of you. Second false assumption is that I'm the boss of me. Third false assumption is that my life is my own. James chapter five, verse one opens this way. Look here, you rich people. uh, Weep and groan with anguish because of all the terrible troubles ahead of you. And I think every single one of, not every single one of us, there's about what, 20% of our church that would just go, 20, 25%, if we're just looking at the law of averages, uh, I don't know, 10, 15% of you that would just go, yeah, okay, I admit, I mean, I'm not rich, but we're well off. The other 75% of us are going, I'm not rich, I'm not rich, because we're looking at that first 25%, we're comparing ourselves to them. But according to ourworldanddata.org, if you make $150 a week, $150 a week, you are in the wealthiest 15% of the people on the planet. So you would say you're not wealthy because you're looking at that first 25% of the people around you. First 20%, 10%, whatever. But 85% of the entire world would say to the teenager who drives one or two nights a week for dominoes, that you are rich. So when the scripture says you who are rich on this planet, that is every single person who is right now listening to the words out of my mouth. You are exactly, I am exactly who James is writing to in chapter five. Here's what he says, verse two. Your wealth is rotting away and your fine clothes 
are moth-eaten rags. Your gold and your silver are corroded. The very wealth you are counting on will eat away your flesh like fire. This corroded treasure you have hoarded will testify against you on the day of judgment. What are some observations about this passage of scripture? Money and wealth aren't evil. Uh, they're not. They're not moral. They are a a moral. Uh, we know that from a ton of other different passages of of scripture. Um, so that the, there's some qualifying statements in this judgment against the wealthy, and and there's there's actually two different words that he uses as qualifying statements as to those that he's that 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 he's saying are not humbling themselves, and it's those who are counting on their wealth. Like those of you who are rich, weep and mourn because the fine clothes that you have are nothing but rotting rags, moth-eaten rags. And the, the gold and the silver that you are hoarding, that's the second qualifying word, uh, have become corroded. The problem isn't money. The problem for us when it comes to being the boss of our lives is the way we use it. It's the value we assign it, and it's the way we look at it. And this comes from a position of arrogance in the eyes of God when it comes especially to those who have chosen to turn from sin and begin following him. Because we work really hard to make enough money that we never are put in a position to have to count on God for our needs. Maybe some of us are going through financial hardship right now simply because God is wanting you to recognize that your job wasn't your savior, but Jesus is. That your employer isn't the one who provides for you, but that God is the one who provides for you. What do you think the point is from this teaching with this wealth that we counted on and the wealth that we have accumulated? Maybe that I'm supposed to count on God more than money. So what can I do to demonstrate that I do count on God more than my money? I I, I don't don't think I can answer that question for you. You're you're making money. You're doing whatever you can to make as much money as you can. And I, I think that you and I need to listen to this passage of scripture and take his warning seriously that there's a very real spiritual danger that we put ourselves in a place where we are opposed by God because we're just accumulating money and we count on it rather than leveraging it and putting it to work for what? So that I can get more? I mean, there's a part of that where we are to invest what we make and the Bible says that we are to pass an inheritance onto our kids that the godly do this. So having an inheritance in a savings account isn't the wrong thing. The wrong thing is when my money becomes my functional savior and not God. How can I tell if my money has become my functional savior and not God? Which one do I use to get more of the other or to do more for the other? That'll answer that question for us. My concern though, is that the wealthier we become, the more independent we are toward God. And that's the danger. Verse four says, for listen, hear the cries of the field workers whom you have cheated of their pay. The cries of those who harvest your fields have reached the ears of the Lord of heaven's armies. You have spent your years on earth in luxury. Here's the qualifying statement. Satisfying your every desire. You have fattened yourself for the day of slaughter. You've condemned and uh, killed innocent people who do not resist you. We use our money to satisfy what? God's kingdom agenda, to do what God's Holy Spirit has put in our heart to do. If if that's how you use your money, is to move the kingdom of God forward, to leverage it as the scriptures teach, and God's Holy Spirit puts it in your heart in accordance to the scripture, great. You've humbled yourself before God, and he will lift you up in honor. But if not, We put ourselves in a place to be opposed by God. And as followers of Jesus, James says, you're playing for the wrong team is what you're doing. We use our money to satisfy our every desire. Uh, That's the answer to the question earlier about what I should be doing with my money to prove that it's not the thing that I'm, I'm depending on, that I'm counting on. 
is that I'm willing to use it for God's kingdom purposes as God's Holy Spirit directs me in alignment with what the scriptures teach. God's plan for the believer is to be productive for his kingdom, not to become fat and self-absorbed. Now, my wife and I, we do want to retire someday, and we are putting money aside. Uh, and I do have uh, a side hustle that, that plays out in my life like a, like a hobby uh, in the evenings when I'm not binge watching net Netflix, right? So in, in our conversations about our future plans for our resources, what we're doing is we're having conversations about in our retirement and as we save. So it's not like we're going to save up and then we'll be a blessing to God. How can we right now put as much emphasis into God's kingdom purposes through this church family, through our hope project. Uh, that's This is the conversation about my wife and I through our missionaries uh, as we are preparing for our future. Because if I'm more concerned about this, preparing for my future, than I am moving God's kingdom forward, then I know that I'm in a position of opposition to God and I'm not okay with that. So my responsibility is not my life, not, not to make my life as comfortable as possible but to make my life as obedient as possible. And this is going to require a budget, self-discipline, and a heart of generosity. And this is the kind of humility that will move God to lift you up in honor. So as we wrap this up, I've just got a few questions for you. Number one is this, who have you determined was less than you? Who have you played judge to? Who have you said is not worth my time? And there's a name that probably popped into your head and you've become their judge and jury. And James says, you as a follower of Jesus, you need to back way up from that. Like if God saw you in opposition to him and still came after you, how many times has God forgiven us for doing the same things over and over and over and over and over again? How many times have you asked God to forgive you for the same thing? And God continues to forgive you and to give you second chances, but we won't give that same kind of grace and compassion forgiveness and love toward other people when they've sinned against us. Now we're holding them to a higher standard to us than what God has held you to him. You've played judge and jury. What I'm asking you to do is to think of ways that you can change your actions toward that person. That's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking what you can do to reconcile with that person and to move into a place of advocacy the people that you don't want to forgive anymore, the people who have hurt you, the people that you that are just beneath you maybe. You look down on them because they're dropouts, because they've got multiple kids from multiple, you see what I'm saying? Like we've all got people that we feel are less than that scripture's called you as a Christian to be an advocate for, not to be a judge over. Who's that person? And what do you need to change? In what area of your life have you made the most moves in your life without consulting God and his will for your life? For me, it's, you know, retirement, it's career, it's, it's, what is it? Like, I, like you've made plans like for your college, for your, for having kids, for buying a house. Like where in your life have you made the most moves without even consulting God? And what is the most obvious move that you can make to undo or to pull back from the direction that you've run without him? What is one small thing that you can do to realign your life with God's will? And the last question is, have you caught yourself working to become self-sufficient without considering your opportunity to be generous towards God's kingdom purposes in the world? Where have you worked to become self-sufficient? Where are you keeping God out of your future? And how are you working just to make your life comfortable? and not meaningful? I don't know the answers to those questions, but hopefully you've judged yourself. And I'm gonna ask you to pray with me. God, I love you with all of my heart, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to teach out of the book of James today. I pray that your Holy Spirit would move in us to point out the thing that needs to be most changed about us. So while your head is bowed and your eyes are closed, I want you to think of the person that you've deemed as less than, less than worthy, less than valuable, less deserving. And I'm asking you to consider being their advocate rather than their judge. Who is that? Maybe it's a group of people. Maybe it's a demographic. Maybe it's an economic status. How can you be an advocate instead of a judge? 
In what area of your life have you made moves? And how will you bring that in alignment to God? Maybe right now your prayer is just, God, this is what I'm wanting to do. But if it's not what you want, then change my heart. Can you make that your prayer? God, let me know in my heart that this is not the person I should marry, or this is the per- type of person I should date, or that we I should go to school or I shouldn't. God, I'm just asking you to direct my next move. That's what I'm asking. Can you just start praying like that before you do anything and start now? And maybe you would look at the way that you're living your life and truthfully, the way that you're spending your time and your energy and your money, it really is all about you. And you're convicted about that. So tell God what you're going to do different. God, I pray that you're pleased by the attitude focus of our prayers and our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being a part of our services this weekend. We don't take it for granted. If there's any way that we could be a blessing in your life, please let us know. You can text the word new if you're new to our services to the number that's on the screen um, or text the word prayer if you need someone to pray with you. If you're interested in going all in as a devoted follower of Jesus, you can even text the word all in right there. Uh, And if you're a follower of Jesus and one of your action steps is to prioritize God and your finances, which Jesus said sets the thermostat for your heart, and you haven't started doing that through this church family, uh, text the word give and we'll send you the link to begin doing that. And because of all of the people who are already doing that who are part of our church family, if you're a part of this service today and you're in financial need, please reach out to us and let us know. If you don't have any groceries, in your pantry, about to have utilities shut off for your kids need clothes, sneakers, or an air conditioner for your daughter's bedroom. We can help you with that, but not if you don't tell us because we're not mind readers, right? Thanks for being part of our services and hopefully we will see you online. God bless. Have a great week.
all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God Hey, thanks for being with us. I'm sure that you've got plenty of other things to do, but I'm glad that you took some time to join us online. Remember, if you're new, let us know. Text the word new to the number on your screen, and this week I'll reach out to you and send you a small gift. And if you've got something you'd like me to pray for, anytime you can text the word prayer and I'll reach out. Have a great day, and I hope that I'll see you next time.